of things that we want to share with you and today's message is just one of them I want to invite you to come and participate in our services here join us here every Sunday morning at 930 for our Bible study we have different speakers that come and you I think you'll enjoy them matter of fact today's message is also one of those I have a special message for you each and every Sunday morning at 1030 right here at Crossroads which meets at theater 3 2800 Ruth Street and Hal right here in uptown Dallas so if you have this Sunday off Come and visit with us, and let's go to the service right now. Heroes and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me. All my fears and failures. Fill my life again. Everything I believe in, now I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Shine your light and let the whole world 
He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the
alive in your lives this week? Amen. He's big, he's big, he's big. Amen? Turn to your Bibles if you would. I thought uh, Tim had something interesting to say this morning. I want to kind of bounce off of that a little bit. If you'll turn to Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's start reading with verse 6, and I'm going to read out of the King James this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. But I say, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every person according as they purpose in their heart, so let them give, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loves a what? A cheerful giver. I, I thought it was interesting what Tim had to say, that God's not going to tell you to do something that isn't good. He's not going to tell you to go and do something bad to somebody. Well, in the same way, he's not going to, the enemy is going to tell you not to give. But when God tells you to give, that's coming from the inside. That's God telling you to do that. And I like what it says that he is giving you seed to sow. He's giving you seed to sow. So when you think about the fact, you know what, God's got so much planned for you that you have to be prepared for that plan to come to place. I thought it was real interesting. My sister and I had a conversation this week about all the things that are going over on in the Philippines. And I had a worker in my house and his wife is from the Philippines and, and we were talking about, you know, all the damage that was done in the southern states. And I, I you know, it's, it's mind boggling how much energy a wind has that has nothing to compare with how much the power of God is on our behalf on our behalf so this morning when when you think about giving he's not gonna he's not gonna tell you to do something that's not on your behalf but the enemy will tell you oh you don't need to do that you don't need to do that you got other things to do you got bills to pay you got obligations you know what I cannot meet my future obligations if I don't give. I can't do it. I cannot do it. Cannot. Because I expect God to do His part. I expect God to do what His Word says. But I also have to remember the fact that God has given me a responsibility. Now He that ministers seed to the sower gives seed to those that sow. So I want us to pray this morning. I want us to thank the Lord that, you know what? We hear from Him. I hear from God. Tim had no idea this morning in Sunday school about what my message is on. We don't talk about it. We don't talk about what's going on, what's happening. But I'll, I'll tell you, God's speaking today. God's speaking today. So let's listen as we pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have an opportunity to come together today to be strengthened, to be amongst fellow believers that have a common denominator, and that's you. We may have a lot of things in common, but Father, that bond that we have that's found in you today is more powerful than anything else on this earth. Father, I thank you for the love that's spread abroad in this congregation. I thank you, I thank you that it's the care and the nurture that we give to each other that is so important, so vital. Heavenly Father, this morning as we worship you, Father, we pray that you'll speak to every person here. And Father, not that they'll pass it off, but Father, that they will listen to what you have to say and then they'll do it. So Heavenly Father, we worship you with our tithes and offerings today and we do it now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and amen. If you're making out a check this morning, make it out to Crossroads. If you're putting cash in the offering, raise your hand. They'll make sure that you get an offering envelope this morning. Amen, amen, amen. Anybody need an offering envelope? Amen. Amen. God is a good God, isn't he? somebody last night that's been away from church for a long time. I thought that was really interesting. He wanted to know what I did for a living, and I said, well, I'm a pastor. He said, is 
mouth like dropped. And I, I said, well, don't pastors get to go on dates too? You know, don't we get to go out? And he said, well, yeah, but you know, you didn't tell me that. I said, you didn't ask. I don't wear that as an arm bandana or something, you know. But it was very interesting how God had orchestrated that whole thing. And uh, it was very interesting. And he, he texted me this morning and he said, you know, he said, you gave me a lot to think about, about my relationship to God. And he'd gone to church when he was a kid. And he's, he's one of 10 kids. His mom and dad were drug abusers, alcoholics, and he, he grew up with his aunt. And uh, he had a, had a child at 15 and uh, has had a life. And it's real interesting. He said, you know, he said, I always wondered what it would be like to have been in church my whole life. I said, well, you have your whole life left. You can start today having your whole life in church. You don't have to start tomorrow. So anyway, that's all good. All good, good, good. Well, I got a message for you today that is tag-teamed right off of what... Uh, Tim had to speak on this morning in Bible study. Uh, got a question for you. When you think about your life, when you think about all the things that you could ever have possibly wanted to be in life, what would be some of the things that, when you were a child, what would they have been when you grew up? What, what would have been, Haley? What, what did you want to be when you grew up? Yeah. Wanted to be a cowboy. Like the riding cowboy? Yes. Seem fun? Absolutely. Who else? What else is someone? What, Mark? Ballerina. <laughs> now that's not too far off. Wanted to be an inventor. Well, you got to do some of that kind of stuff. So you really did kind of grow up into what you wanted to do. Anybody else? Doug, did you always want to be a dentist? Oh. Yeah. Always got to be home. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Teacher? Who said that? Okay, Joel, you wanted to be a teacher when you grew up? Okay. Tim? <laughs> Keith, what did you want to be? You wanted to grow up and be a superhero, Superman. I bet you had a cape when you were younger. I bet you. Oh, is it? Sean, what did you want to be? You wanted to be what? An attorney? We all, had, we all had different ideas, didn't we? Are we disappointed the fact that we may not have grown up into be what we thought we wanted to be? Are we disappointed? It's real interesting to talk to some kids today, uh, younger kids, and some of them are on a track and they've got their mindset exactly what they want and they are driving home to that and they're banging, banging, banging every day towards that mark. And I think that's, I think that's really pretty neat that they have that so young, because uh, I didn't have that. When, when I was a child, I, I knew I wanted to be a medical missionary. I didn't know exactly how that was going to come about. Uh, but I have to think about it today in the fact that partly that came true, just in a different way than maybe what my mind's eye saw it then as compared to what it went up a little bit later. So, you know, I know a lot of people would like they wanted to be, you know, a climber. They always wanted to 
to do something with their life and they wanted to climb to, climb to some mountain peak, whether it be Everest or you know, one of the other big ones, McKinley or any of the big ones up in the Northwest. Uh, I know a lot of people, and I've done this. Uh, my former wife gave me for my birthday many, many years ago a ride in a hot air balloon. And I thought it'd be really neat to be the, the pilot of one. Because all they do is they just get to ride all the time and somebody else pays for them to ride. I thought that would be pretty cool. Uh, windsurfing, I don't know that I would want to be this guy <laughs> as he's coming down, but I've always thought that would be pretty neat too. Uh, I know many of us, when we were kids, some of us wanted to become pilots. You know, and I thought about Missy, you know, working with, with the planes and what she does, and I, I, I thought, well, wouldn't it be neat to be an airplane pilot, and, you know, fighter pilot in a war or something like that? Everybody has different aspirations, and, you know, some people want to be police officers. I know that was a big thing when I grew up, you know, everybody wanted to play like a police officer. And, grow up and come out of an academy and all that kind of thing. And we have a lot of wonderful police officers and we have some that not so wonderful. And I know a lot of people wanted to become a, a firefighter. Anybody wanted to become a fireman when they grew up? Anybody? Nobody? Oh, did you really, Chris? Public servant? Did you want to look like this one right here? <laughs> I know this is probably the kind of, you know, Fireman that we would all want. Joe, would you? I think we need to have a calendar of all of our guys, and I, I, you know, this would be the calendar of the kind of people that I think we should be. We all got to have gym memberships. We're going to go with, with Jose and and uh, Brian to LA Fitness and work out. I don't know that we'll all look like that. I don't think there's enough years in the life left to look like that. Doug, you think? No, I don't either. You don't think he is? Okay. Yeah. Well, what I want to talk to us today is about getting to where we're supposed to be. And that place is unequal to any other place. You know, we can have all the aspirations in life that we want, but there should be really only one goal. And so what I want us to talk about today is the fact that we have to reach his calling. What does he want us to do? And I thought very interesting about what Tim had to offer this morning in Sunday school because it was talking about sonship and being a son or a daughter of God. And uh, I want you to take a look at the scripture with me. If you've got your Bibles, you might want to take a look. I've got it up here. Uh, Colossians 3, 1 and 2, it says, If you then being risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. You know what? That should be all of our desire. That should be the place where we want to be. But I know for a lot of people, that is almost impossible to even think about because they feel so far away from God. Another scripture. Ephesians 2, 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know what? That really has already happened. Hadn't it? Aren't we already sitting there? I don't know about your table. When you grew up, we had assigned seats at our table. My dad always sat at the head, my mom always sat to his right, my sister always sat to his left, and I sat down at the opposite end of where my dad sat. If they were still alive and we were having dinner, that's we would go to those four places. Because they were like assignments. And you have an assignment, and this is yours. You are supposed to take your rightful seat. You're supposed to be sitting right there and everything that goes along with sitting right there. But a lot of times we don't think that. We think that we're someone less than that. But God doesn't see us like that. God sees us like he sees his other son, Jesus, sitting there with him. But the problem is, you know what? We've had so much junk in our life, we can't see ourselves there. 
it's hard to get our minds focused on where we're supposed to be because of all the other stuff that's going on. And I thought it was interesting, Chris was talking about this morning, it's about renewing your mind, and it is. It is about getting a good mental image of who you are supposed to be. When I was in high school, a friend of mine was in track and field. Now, I, I was not a good runner. I, I was never in that. I was in band. We were marching around the field, and that was about all I wanted to do. But I was always amazed, especially when track and field came around because all the guys were running, and it was a nice, nice look, you know. But I had a friend who was in the high hurdles, and I remember that when he first started out, you know, getting that stretch of those legs going out across that hurdle was really important because oftentimes your back foot would clip the top of that and pull it over. And the coach was always penalizing those guys because they, he wanted them to stretch out. And so for every one that they knocked over, they had to do an extra lap at the end of the day. You knock very many of those over and you're there for a while. And he had to get a mental picture of himself going over that. Because every time he knocked one over or he felt it tip with his foot, he would look behind him to see if it tipped over. And he would plow through the next couple because he was looking this way. And you can't afford to be doing that. You have a finish line that you're supposed to be looking at. You cannot afford to look at the mistakes that you've made because they will continue to trip you up. God is not the one who reminds you of all that stuff. He has chosen to forget your mistakes and your failures. He has chosen to see you as a son and a daughter. But we have this tendency of going, uh, you know, I, I'll never make that because of this or that, and this mistake and that mistake. And... But, you know, this scripture, brethren, I do not imagine that I have yet laid hold of it, that finish line. This is Paul writing, and if anybody was close to that finish line, he was. But this one thing I do, and the word no should be in there, this one thing I do know, forgetting everything which is past, stretching forward to what lies in front of me with my eyes fixed on the goal, I push on to secure the prize of God's highward call in Christ Jesus. That word press is really an interesting word. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you remember the old black and white movies or the early movies where they had those big wind machines that they showed and people were leaning in to the wind and they would throw leaves in there and all this stuff would come flying at them. That's what you need to figure that is talking about. Pressing into that space that God wants you to be. You actually have to decide that is something that I want and I am going to have to push against all of the odds against me from doing that. And the enemy is going to be the one trashing all that stuff, reminding you about all the things and the mistakes you've ever lived with. Your choice, though, is to be more like the Heavenly Father and forget those things. So I want to give you some ideas to think about this morning. One is... You have got to choose to forget your past. How many of you have tried? I mean, seriously, we've tried to forget those things, haven't we? And every time you tell your coming out story, you're reminded of all that. You know, people want to know how you came out. This gentleman that I had a, had a, had a date with last night, he's up from Austin. And his business is in Austin, and he came up, and we... We're having this conversation. He said, well, you know, tell me about your coming out story. And that was when I ended up pulling. I said, how far can we go in that, in that onion tonight? You know, how, how many layers can we unplug without this whole thing falling apart? And 
So I, I started at the very beginning. Might as well. And I went through all that. And I said, there are moments that I'm not proud of in that whole process. You know? But as a mistake that those were, God chooses not to see those anymore because the blood of Jesus keeps him from seeing that. He cannot see past that. I'm here, and I'm living with that, but he has chosen to paint over all of that with the blood of his son. So he can't see those things anymore. He sees me through that filter, and that filter causes him to see another of his kids. He can't see those imperfections because of the perfectness of Christ that has been applied to my life. He cannot see that. So I may share that and I may be reminded and I may not like it, but the good thing that I know is that God does not hold that accountable to me today because he has forgiven me. Your past failures, you've got to stop thinking about them as penalties because they are steps that God has brought you through or is in the process of bringing you through. And that's more along the lines of yourself. You can't allow them to undermine your thinking and you remind yourself that I've got confidence in God, you know? He has done a good work. His blood has been applied to me. I can walk every day and know that I am saved. I don't have to worry about it. I'm not, I'm not even thinking about it anymore. There were times that I thought about it because you have heard and heard and heard all the old wrong junk and until you get your mind renewed to what the Bible really says, then there's opportunity for the enemy to really whip up on you. But you have to, you have to make that decision. You have to decide to forget those things and you have to cultivate new kinds of thinking. And this is the step that what I see a lot of people not doing. They do not do that. Let God's word create thoughts of prosperity. What's a good scripture for prosperity? Given it shall be given unto you. What's another one? You need to know those because that's what he has in store for you. Beloved, above all things, I wish that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. He above all things you know what so i go around thinking to myself you know what i don't have to be poor that would be my choice but that's not god's choice for me. that's not his choice power what's the scripture about power behold he has given us what to walk on serpents and scorpions and over all of the enemy he's given us power over all of that you need to have some scripture for all of the weak areas in your life so that you can, when the devil comes at you, just like your elder brother Jesus whipped out the sword of the Spirit, and he says, not by bread alone, but by every word, you know. Every time the enemy confronted him, he had a scripture that rolled off of his tongue, and he defeated the enemy. That's what the thinking has got to be. Your thought process has got to be replacement of old thought with new thought. It doesn't happen because you want it to. I want a lot of things. But I'll tell you, my house doesn't get clean because I want it to be clean. <laughs> that means I have to actually physically get up, get the vacuum out, and vacuum. I can see that stuff on the floor and I say, get up, go in the trash. But it doesn't listen. I would want that, but it doesn't do that. I have to get involved in it. You're gonna to have to get involved in the cleaning up of your thought life too. But you have to, when you take the bad stuff out, you have to be willing to put the good stuff back in because your goal is to reach his high calling. Not to be satisfied with something that's less than that. You know, 
if someone had left you millions of dollars and it was accessible to you, but you chose to live less than that, can you imagine how silly that sounds? Can you imagine how bad that would make you feel if you had all that available and you just chose not to use it? That's like having a car in your garage and walking someplace in the winter. Not because you had to, but you made that choice. You have to make that choice to get away from what God has for you by bad thought process. He wants you to have good things because he has got his nature built into your DNA. You are already is. Already is. So I've got to think about, I've got a high calling. Our high calling, Ephesians 1.18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. You need to realize that everything, you know, and I heard a number of stories when I was a kid, you know, what bad theology. Well, when you get there, it's gonna be wonderful. It's gonna be luscious green pastures. You're gonna be out there with all the other saints. And, you're, and I'm going like, wow, that's a good picture. But when you understand what the model prayer was, be it on earth as it already is in heaven. He was trying to get us to understand that, you know what? All of that that is laid in store for us is available to us today. You don't have to wait till the good by and by. You can, and a lot of people do. And I'm wondering what they think when they get up there and God has all of this stuff all packaged up great big ribbons and bows on it, beautiful wrappings, and we get there, and we say, God, what is that? He said, that's all the things you could have had on earth, but you chose not to take them. I don't want to be that kind of son. I want to be the son that wakes up and realizes that, you know what? My dad is rich. He's rich. Why am I where I'm at. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Nothing that can separate you. There is not a power on heaven or in earth or below earth that can keep you from getting what God has already given you except When somebody gives you a gift, you actually have to hold your hand out to get it. You can't get it like this. Because it will fall right in front of them. You actually have to take it from them. You have to take what God has given you to yourself. It's there waiting for you. Prosperity, healing, all the things, the gifts of the Spirit, all the manifestation of who He is on in earth can be yours on earth too. So our high calling. So we have to decide something. <clears throat> we, have to be, we have to decide that we've been called into some liberty. And I love this thought, and I want you to think about it. For brethren, you have been called into liberty, not only liberty for the occasion to the flesh, but to serve one another. You see, I think grace is really good. How many of you think grace is good? Boy, aren't we glad we got it. A lot of people don't understand how big that grace really is. Once you do, and that it covers everything, then there's a whole different mindset about what comes on. But God doesn't give you all of that just so that you can have your acts covered. He gives that as an opportunity for you to see what's been given to you that you can give to others and take care of other people. Liberty from sin, sickness, fear, poverty, death. You don't have to worry about dying. I think it's really funny. 
I know many of you saw the movie Bridesmaids. Did you see the version of it where uh, Tina Fey, not Tina Fey, who's the girl in it? Who's the lead? I can't remember her name from SNL. Anyway, she, huh? No, I can't, I can't remember. Anyway, her character goes, she's been set up with a date, and so she goes in the house, and the guy says, I've got to go do a few little things. Why don't you sit down here with my, with my son, and the babysitter's not here. Sit down with him, and I'll be right back. Did you all see that version? Because there were actually two versions. This was cut out of the movie theater, but if you rented it, they had the full cut in there. Anyway, so here's this girl who's going to have a date with his dad. His mom and dad are either separated or in early stages of divorce. They're not living together. He's been set up by somebody that's in the wedding party. So she goes over there and she sits on the sofa and this little guy is just freakishly strange. Got big glasses on and he's sitting on the sofa and he's looking across from her. And she's, he says to her, are you afraid of dying? Just that was the first question. Did you see that or not? It's in, it's, in, it's in the cut. Anyway, so she says, are you afraid of dying? And she's pausing. She's trying to come up with an answer to this little kid. And she says, well, I, I don't know. Are, are, are you afraid of dying? He says, I don't know, but my mommy's going to kill you. <laughs> okay, I guess you should be afraid of dying. We should not fear death. There, it should be an absence of fear. We only know at best the years that we're alive right now. Should we be given that 70? Should we be able to live well through that 70 years? People get afraid because they don't know what that next step over is like. If you find out what your Heavenly Father is about, there will be no fear. There should be running towards that. But it's amazing as a pastor, and I've talked with a number of people that were dying. <clears throat> and I asked them all, I said, you know, are you, are you prepared? Are, are you good with God? Because a lot of them are people in the community and the They'll call and say, can you come visit a friend of mine? He's dying and done and done. I'll go. And, you, and, and you, it's hard to ask people that are in that last few days, are they good with God? And hear them say, no. And then to give them a simple little plan of accepting Jesus and to see their life transformed in a moment. From fear and trepidation to wondering if they're gonna get one more heartbeat, gonna get one more breath, to almost a lack of anxiety and stress because they finally got a picture of the fact that God does love them. God does love you. And there is nothing good that he would withhold from you. Nothing good. So liberty, to take care of other people, always. <clears throat> the fellowship of Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, 9. God is faithful, everybody say he's faithful. By whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son Jesus Christ, our Lord. You are God's champion. Well, you are if you have that kind of thinking. But it takes your thought process getting there. You have to decide, you know what? I am going to live like my dad is the big dad on the block. Now, when I was growing up, my dad was very quiet kind of a guy. And uh, I was talking to somebody the other day. His dad is always calling him and wanting to go out to dinner with him, go out to lunch with him, and da 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 da. And I said, you need to take every moment you can and do that. And he said, why? I said, well, because I didn't have that with my dad. My dad was a, if, if you could be a recluse and still work and get out in it, my dad would be that. Very laid back, 
he liked football, but he never got emotional about it. I never saw anything. I saw my dad laugh in my whole life, probably a half a dozen times. And it was usually at my mother. I only saw him get mad a couple of times. And that was when they were playing 42 and she would trump his already, already good clutch, you know. And so I, I never really saw a lot of emotion out of my dad. But there was another guy on the block whose dad was like the football guy that get out there and toss the ball and get out there with the baseball and pitch the ball to him and all that stuff. And you look across the way and you say, why can't my dad be like that? Your dad is that and a whole lot more. He is all of that. Be conformed to the image of Jesus. Look here, Romans 8, 28 and 9, this is what Tim was reading from this morning. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them that are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he has already known you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows you before you're afraid. And he whispers in your ear, be not afraid, I am with you always. To know that there is someone there watching over you all the time, how important is that? For whom he did foreknow and did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn of a many brethren. <clears throat> what was Jesus like? All the things that we think about him today. He conquered sin. We sang about it today. Mountains were moved because of him. Time was stopped. Everything that he had, we have. You need to wrap your mind around that. You need to wrap around the fact that God predestined you for good things. My youngest daughter and her husband had a little baby not too long ago. And he is the cute little guy. Cute, cute, cute. And she had that baby through IVF. And if you don't know that process, they go in through surgery and they harvest eggs from her tubes and her fallopians and they pull all those eggs together out of her ovaries. And then they take my sperm and they mix all that up in a cocktail, hoping that these will take. They had eight embryos that took. They tried two at the first time, two at the second time, and we were getting kind of concerned because there was only eight and half of them were gone. And so the next time, two more, and one of those took, and we got little Jake. But they have two more. Those children are already predestined. They're not born yet but they're already predestined to look like their mom and their dad. Now, when they happen, they're going to look like Mike and Abigail. They're going to be monsters. Because <laughs> Mike is 6'4 and Abigail is 6 foot. They're going to be tall. <laughs> Gargantuans, you know. But their DNA is held already in that place. They are predestined to look like their parents. You are predestined to be the child of God. You are predestined to all that he has. He has already given you everything that pertains to godliness. He has already given you everything that pertains to being like God. You already have. So when you think about God not having something for you, I got news for you, he's got a lot of stuff for you. A lot of stuff. The thing of it is, if you don't know about it, the enemy rejoices 
because you're living less than what God has planned for you to do. That is not God's design. He wants you to be just like Jesus on this earth, performing miracles at the needs of other people, taking his love, his care, his compassion, his healing touch to a group of people that don't have an understanding of that. They're like those little embryos. They haven't been born again. They have no knowledge of who their Heavenly Father is. They don't know. So we should adopt His image. <clears throat> when I was in my other church, a straight church in North Dallas, had a guy, a whole family. They started with me when we first started Greater Life, and uh, their dad was my drummer. He was a drummer through Prohibition, so he had all kinds of stories. Because he used to play all the nightclubs that were locked up and in secret places and stuff like that, and the raids would come and all kinds of stuff, and everybody just ducked, you know, it's wild stories. Well, he and his wife <clears throat> lived down in South Dallas. They were a black couple, and they had, they had 12 children. And so his children came to church with the older kids were had their families and stuff like that because they were widespread in these years. And one of them was named Jay Hughes after his dad. And tall guy, striking, very handsome black guy, had a wonderful wife, and they were trying to have a child, and they finally did have this cute little boy. He was born premature and had struggles and lots of early health issues when he was a baby. And, was in infant care for a long time in the hospital, and they finally got to bring him home. And we were all rejoicing that this little guy was home. Well, over the years, you just got to see this little guy grow up. You could see him with all of the other children, and you knew exactly who he belonged to because he had the same walk that his dad had because he would walk behind him. And he just mimicked that little walk. It was just perfect. He couldn't have been trying to do it any better than he was doing it. Because he was imitating his dad. You should be imitating who your dad is. You should have all of the attributes that he has. So that when people see you, there should be no differentiation between you and your Heavenly Father. They should see you and see Him. That should be in your makeup, your DNA. It's already there. But you're going to have to decide, I'm going to lay down all this old stuff. Put on all of the armor of God, all those good things that he's provided for you, that helmet of salvation, you need to get this saved. What's between your ears? And realize that God has got great things for you. Got great things for you. Put on the new man, the new woman, which is renewed in knowledge, renewed, 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 renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created. Get a picture of how big God is. Get a picture on the inside of you and recognize the fact that, you know what? If you're living less than that, it's not because he hasn't given you everything already. It's our choice because we haven't decided to get this up and running 100% yet. We're allowing it to do something else. So, Ephesians 4.13 Till we should attain, all attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of God's Son, reaching maturity. That's what you were talking about this morning, being perfect, reaching maturity, reaching the full measure of development which belongs to the fullness of Christ. You know what? We've got work to do every day. Every single day, I want to become more and more like Him. That means that I've got to spend more and more time with him so that I understand who he is. I know who he is. There's never a question on about what to do because I know him. Some of you have got friends that you know so well, you know 
the foods that they like, you know the drinks that they like, you know what they like to do, and you accommodate them because they're your friends. You should know God that well. You should spend time with Him and know Him that well. You should. You are the rightful heir and a child of the king who has great things in store for you and that's who you are whether you believe it or not that's true let's take a moment let's pray this morning heavenly father i thank you that <clears throat> we are being conformed to your image we're allowing all the old stuff to die away so that all things become new. And Father, that's us. We want to become in your likeness. So Heavenly Father, today, we submit ourselves to your hand. Father, we all know that song, Mold Me and Make Me After Your Way. Father, we submit our lives to you today. We don't want to be like the world. We want to be just like you. So, Heavenly Father, you speak into our lives. Speak to us every day. We are going to press in to you. The enemy doesn't want us to, but we are going to choose to make that decision to be more like you every single day. We want to know every attribute. We want to know everything that you have in store for us. Heavenly Father, we worship you today. And we are your children. And we want to become just like you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. You got some work to do, kids. You need to walk like your dad walks. You need to speak like your dad speaks. You need to be the one that everybody wants to be around because they see your life is so spectacular. That's what they want to be like. That's going to make them want to be like you. I mean, no question about how it happened. They're going to ask you, how is everything happening so good to you? Even when bad things come, you always seem to bounce back and things get better. They should. They should. You have a great week this week. God bless you. Hi, and thank you for watching today's service. As I spoke to you at the beginning, we have a couple of outreaches which I think are important for you to know that we're participating in, and you might want to join us. We've got one, which is our orphanage in Uganda. It's 320 children, about, that have been left there because their parents have either died or are affected by HIV AIDS. There are no relatives that will take them in because it's such a stigma to have HIV or even to be gay there in Uganda. We also have a church in Tegucigalba, Honduras. It's just a starting work, but there is a lot that we can do to help them. And if you'd like to join and be a part of that, we invite you to go to our webpage, www.crossroadscommunitychurch.us, and you'll see a tab there that says donation. You can make your donation through PayPal. It's secure, and we'll get that, and we'll send it on to them. So if you'd like to participate, we thank you for doing it in advance because we know that God is going to bless you. Thank you for watching today, and tune in next week.